I should remind you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so thanks. Thanks for the catch. So welcome to Trading Group One, everyone. If you're new, uh, this is a, a weekly meeting of traders just talking about trading and things that impact uh, the markets. Um, for all, all experience levels, if you're new, feel free to ask questions. There's a lot of experienced people here. And uh, if you have a trading uh, idea or maybe a trade that's in trouble or you have questions, uh, you know, feel free to, to let us know and we'll take a look at it. All right, so I've got uh, Merlin's our old parrot and uh, he's my test user. So I've got this new thing on the home called my tasks. So I had this timer thing before I use and it's actually pretty useful. I would use it to set little timers like change the furnace filter and stuff, but I kind of expanded that to this task thing. So if I add a task, like say it, I do want to change like the furnace filter, to furnace filter. And I'll just make it like a low priority and I'll do it like on Saturday. Uh, let's see, and I'll send myself a reminder a couple days before and maybe do this every quarter and I'll do like three of them. So now it'll create a task. And if I do all future ones, there's all the four tasks that I just created. Um, you can also set up, um, categories for them. So I don't have any for this, but um, for for my one, I just have a category called home and then one for work. And, you know, you can separate them different ways, um, but it's pretty cool because it sends you reminders. And um, actually, if it if you go to your home page now, if you have a task set up, it'll actually um, tell you your next task expires in five days and it's your furnace filter. And if there's multiple due on the same day, it'll just list them out here. So it's kind of a nice thing if you use, if you come to the website a lot to check the markets, you know, on the homepage, it shows all your tasks coming up and real easy to manage. So um, the recurring here, just, this just shows that it's set to recur, but there's no future event for this. So that kind of reminds you, okay, I need to reset this. And I use it for things like uh, birthdays. Uh, you know, if I sign up for a subscription, like a trial, I want to remind myself to either make a decision to keep it going or cancel it. I'll set a reminder for that. And it's pretty useful. So I thought I'd turn it on for everybody. So enjoy that. It's uh, kind of cool. So now we were going to talk about this CML Viz. Let me, um, let me go. I think I'm already logged in. Yeah. Okay. So let me just close these other tabs. All right, so if you're not familiar with it, uh, Ophir, he was a former market maker on the CBOE and he created this thing called Trade Machine Pro, which is essentially a, a pretty good backtesting tool. Uh, I did work with Larry Richards at Quante Carlo, um, which was an attempt at a backtesting piece of software, but Gammon Capital bought the whole company and took it off the market a few years, like five, six years ago. Um, but this is kind of what Quante Carlo should have been and never was. So it's um, it's pretty cool. It's uh, they, they've kind of changed it in the last year or two. And um, this is their new like today thing. So they've got all these different uh, strategies like buy the dip and fade the dip and um, you know, like a TT, a bullish TTM squeeze, that kind of stuff. Things with earnings, um, technical breakouts. So lots of different things going on. And this gets updated every day. I think it's in, um, I don't know if it's delayed quotes or real time, but it, it's updated uh, during the market hours. So if you wanna filter it to like, you know, the NASDAQ 100, you can do that. Um, but anyway, if there's a strategy on here, like um, let's just pick one, like this by the dip on, I think it's Nokia. So this is their back test tab. And like it says here, if you click this little box, it will expand and uh, show all the details of this uh, test, including what the stock price has done in that period, how many wins, losses, average win, average loss, all that good stuff. And then all the trades, and you can even download them if you wanna you know, look at them in detail. Um, and then if you notice, there's a comma after this. So on the settings up here in the right, you can actually use your own deltas. So I think they've got some deltas set and I've got that checked. So if I wanna see all of those deltas, I just get rid of the comma. The comma just uses the middle one that you've got set, but if you don't have a comma, then it just, I think it's five. And then you can compare them. 
So this just ran a quick back test on these different flavors, and it shows on the chart visually what was going on. So it's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, as far as the strategies, you can do you know, the standard call puts, spread, straddle, strangle, iron condor, and even make up a custom one. Now it's all based on deltas. So you could make up one like a broken wing butterfly and say you do like a, well, let's go a long put at say like a what, 40 delta. And we'll do like five contracts. And then we'll do a short put at a, say what, 30 delta, we'll do 10. And then we'll do a long put at what, maybe like a 15 delta and do five. And so now if we save this, oh, I think I already have one called broken wing butterfly. Yeah. So now you can run that broken wing butterfly on a, a stock symbol and it'll, you know, it'll take those parameters and run with it. Um, so let's just go back to the standard ones. Um, you can do earnings handling. So these error messages keep popping up. Um, so long or short earnings, either trade earnings, only trade earnings or never trade earnings um, or customize, you know, like how many days before or after. And I think if you say don't trade earnings and the, the back tester will close and not open any positions within two days plus or minus earnings. So just kind of avoids it. And then you can have some technical um, conditions of when to open the trade. So you could do things like if the stock crosses up through a certain moving average or um, let's see, crosses down, let's see what else you can do. RSIs, Bollinger Bands, um, VIX levels. So lots of things you can test. And then, um, you can close it on a technical close. So again, you could use like a, say a VIX level or um, crossing above or below some moving average, um, or you can use like gains above or below a certain percentage. So like right now there's no limit. Let's just do like a call spread and I'll just do like one Delta. Um, you can also change the day's expiration. So if you want something shorter term, you could do that. And I don't even know what this is. Let's do, do like a bull squeeze for a long call spread. Okay, so there, there you go, 87% return, uh, five trades, 40% win. So win rate's kind of low, but you can play around with these. So with, um, let me close this again. So right now it's 87% uh, return with the 40% wins, but let's change this to say, uh, we'll, we'll take a profit of 50% and we won't let a loss go below half of the, uh, um, uh, the amount we risk. So that changes it quite a bit. Now your win rate's only 20% and you have a 45% loser. So what happens if you get rid of the downside risk? And I guess you're limiting the gain is in fact impacting it the most, it looks like. Yeah, that actually turns it into a winner. Well, you can play around with this a lot. And in fact, I had a spreadsheet. I was just kind of goofing around with it. And this was an Amazon test I did. It was a uh, long Amazon um, call spread, buy a 60 Delta, sell a 40 Delta. I think it was 30 days expiration, but I can't, don't hold me to that because I can't remember exactly what I had set. And then it was using a bullish TTM squeeze, like the John Carter thing. And it was a five-year test. And then I, I did some testing. Uh, I just plugged in these numbers. Let me do a data sort. And I'll sort on gains above and then losses. Okay, so here I tested um, different variations. And this would be interesting for things like, say, a... Um, um, uh, parking trade if you want to see like well is it better to set like a 80 percent profit target 90 percent um, no profit target you know just let it expire or so many days in the trade you know those are kind of variations you can play with uh, but on this one um, amazon thing this test i did i just played around with different uh, combinations and uh, you can see it, it changes the results quite a bit anywhere from like this one was only a 283 percent gain versus one, I think it was over 2000. Yeah, so this one. So this was uh, take your profit at 60% and cut your losses at a 60%. That actually had the best, uh, um, had the highest return. 
so it was interesting. You know, a lot of times we'll set numbers like 50 50. And uh, is that the best one? I don't know. It's uh, you got to test it. And that's this makes it pretty easy to do because it's so fast. So you can say, OK, well, 80 percent was this 4.3 percent return. What's an 85? Uh, still the same. How about a 90? Um, I guess it really hasn't changed. Okay, but um, you can also test during uh, 2007 to 2009 period. You can do short-term stuff. You can go back 10 years. So it's pretty flexible in that way. Um, if you do find something that you like, you can add an alert. And the alerts were, it looked like they were working on the server earlier. Oh yeah, it's still kind of messed up. It has a, uh, looks like a coding error. Um, so they're gonna have to fix that. Um, but basically, when it's working, when you click on Add Alert, it lets you set up uh, an alert that goes to you via email and or SMS. And then there's a link to share the, uh, I think, is that this, the, the share link? Yeah. So this actually gets posted into the, uh, um, into the alert. And then you can put a little comment like, you know, this alert was a uh, buy the dip or, or whatever pre-earnings play you're doing or something, just so you remember what is the thing being triggered right now. Um, but the nice thing is you can set up tons and tons of alerts. You know, you could do like a find a strategy and, and monitor the whole market or the S&P 500, and it'll keep scanning for all these different um, conditions. And when it's right, it'll send you an alert and then you can go enter the trade. So you don't have to sit there and monitor it. You can set it all up, find strategies you like with a decent return and all the numbers that you're looking for. And then uh, it just you know, monitors it for you, which is pretty cool. Um, the pro scan is a, uh, uh, again, it's looking for, um, instead of back testing, this is kind of scanning the market for looking for things. Let's look at the NASDAQ 100 and do, oh, I don't know, um, by the dip technical. Let's just see what that does. So here's a list of different stocks, run rates. You can sort it by all these different columns. So Starbucks had 10 trades in that period. And let's see if we just click on it just to see what it's like. Okay, so this had a almost 700% return. Um, pretty nice numbers. Average return per trade is 45%. And um, yeah, I mean, this is a really great scanner. And Dave Johnson says he's used this for about a year and a half for the earnings trades, 14 day diagonals with an 80% win rate. Um, and they're charging, I think the, um, the list price is 199, but I think so there's a group rate for us, it's 129. And I think I put that in the um, on that spreadsheet, but I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, it's just pretty easy to remember, aramir.com slash trade machine. Um, but it's a nice tool and uh, I like the monitoring of it where it'll just, you know, you set up all the alerts and I, I think you can set hundreds of alerts if you want to, but it's, um, it's pretty awesome. And uh, you can do a lot of testing really fast, which is nice. I, that's one thing I like about it. Now, Quanti Carlo, if you ever saw it, it was very complex. Uh, Larry was had their own custom icons and you didn't know what it was doing. And um, you could make it very complex back test, but it was also almost like uh, programming a programming language to set up a decent back test. Uh, but this has simplified it quite a bit. So um, you know, we talked about it uh, last week, and you know, this is a, kind of a quick demo of it. Um, they have on their Learn tab, they've got lots of videos of how things work, and they said they're updating them. So some of these are a little older, some of them are fairly current, um, but they're in the process of kind of doing a refresh on it. Um, so anyway, that's uh, just a quick overview of the CML Viz Trade Machine Pro. It's uh, kind of a nice tool. Uh, one nice thing with it, if you do get in at a certain price, that will never raise your subscription level. So I know Ophir had talked about that you know, over time, they keep adding more and more stuff to it. Like this back testing stuff, when I first signed up for it um, years ago, they didn't have um, 
any technical stuff. So you couldn't do like a technical close or a technical open, um, but they've added all that stuff and they're, they keep adding more and more. So it's, um, it's pretty nice. And again, one of the things I like about it the most is once you find something you like, you can set up the alerts and just kind of, you don't even have to log in anymore. It just keep sending you trade messages, which is cool. So I know Tim, you've taken a look at this. Uh, do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, well, um, uh, it it is really good at sending out those alerts that happen when the when the when the uh, conditions happen. You know that you should do. Uh, they come in email and and uh, I get them in time to act on them if I wanted to. I have acted on a few of them, and I I'd have to look it up because it's been a little while. But they would uh, they worked. You know. Um, so I think that the analysis is good. You know, the analysis meaning, you know, the statistics on when they fill and when they don't fill. Right. Like here's, here's an example of one that they sent, um, a couple of days ago on AMD. So I get an email technical alert. Um, you can also again, send it to SMS if you want. And here's what the, uh, the thing was and all the conditions for your, your scan. And then, uh, there's a link to it in uh, Trade Machine Pro. So if I click on it, it should load it right up. So it's uh, very user friendly. And uh, I imagine with the cover call stuff, that's again, one of their strategies. So you could probably use this to kind of tweak what you're doing with the cover calls. Yeah, I actually did not use it for this because um, I do all those on my own, but um, I did use it for some of the other strategies that they have out there, you know? Yeah. Um, Oh, and uh, Mark asked where he's sign up. Uh, again, I just posted the link in here. It's just airmere.com slash uh, trade machine, just like that. And that'll take you to this page. Um, and you can see it's it's got Aramir on there. So you know you're on the right place, but here it is. It's normally they're charging 200 a month. And like Ophir said, their goal is at some point to get it up to 500 a month because they'd say it's, you know, a lot of institutions are using it too. And um, I don't disagree with it. You know, if you're using it to find trades and it's doing all that monitoring for you, I think it's worth it. Uh, but anyway, that's just, uh, I know we talked about it just briefly last week and I wanted to give a quick walkthrough of it. So it's, uh, yeah, nice. Um, I don't think there's any questions. I don't know if, if they've got this alert thing fixed yet. No, but still, they're doing something on their server. It looks like a Windows server with uh, IIS, so um, who knows what they're doing on it. <laughs> uh, okay, so I see another thing I started doing is um, with Expert Signal, I'm playing around with doing image captures every minute. So I use Snagit for my screen capture tool, and if you haven't used that, it's actually a pretty good tool for that. It's at techsmith.com. And I forget what they charge for it. It's like 40 or 50 bucks, something like that. Let's see, snag it. I just click on buy, it'll tell me, I'm sure. There you go, $50. Um, but one thing you can do with snag it is set up presets and assign hotkeys to it. So I literally have a hotkey with a, a region of a screen and I can't show you because it's on my other computer that's also running a meeting. So I can't actually do both, but um, what it does is it's got a preset region and then um, it has a, 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 na a naming convention for the files. So if I pull up a directory that it's generating uh, right here, this is linked to my laptop. So it takes like the year, month, day, hyphen, hour, minute, second, and then GBP, British pound, and then 10 minute chart and a PNG file. And they have different file formats you can pick. So I found the one that was the smallest, but then you can see I've got a, a macro with Macro Express that just fires off a macro that goes and uh, changes the time frame on the software, takes a screen capture with this, changes the time frame again, does a different hotkey to change to get the five minute chart, and then it, it resets everything. So this macro is just running all the time, hitting these hotkeys, uh, kicking off Snagit. And it's generating uh, charts like this every minute, so it's really good for uh, stepping through and learning how these uh, how the software works. Um, 
But anyway, that's I started doing that, and um, on Friday I got the macro working. It's been working today fine. So I'm going to be uh, posting um, the screenshots of this. So if I compress all these for Friday, I think it was like a 20 meg file with 600 images, and um, you know, versus some of these recordings they post, they're like you know over a gigabyte. I think the one on Friday was I started it at. Oh gosh, it was before 11 o'clock my time and I, I let it run. I forgot to stop it and restart it. And it was like a 19 hour recording. It was like two and a half gigabytes. So, you know, file size differences. If you just want to step through the trades, you know, every minute there's a new one. Um, it uh, It's actually pretty fast to step through images. So, you know, if you just get like a couple of them then you can just use a photo viewer and just start stepping through it like this. And um, it's pretty easy to uh, kind of follow along without massive download sizes. Uh, so that's another thing I'm doing. Um, oh, in the macro program, if you haven't used uh, something like this, this macros.com is just fantastic for, for all kinds of automation. You know, you can do it for say like um, your email signature or any kind of text that you want to type repetitively or um, a process like you have to do a screen capture at, at a regular interval or you want to restart your machine overnight or you know lots of different things it can do but um, I've been using this for years and the more I use it the more I like it so if you want any kind of automation it's really great um, yeah the screen capture strip let's see um, how can I do this it's on my other computer so let me just do this i can maybe take a screenshot of it hmm. now probably the uh the macro is what you're talking about so okay here's the script let me see if i can just grab a screenshot of this And I'll save that to my capture directory. Sorry, I'll just take a second here. Okay, so now it should be in that directory. I can access it from this computer in theory. That's this one. Yeah, here it is. So this is the Macro Express macro that I do. So um, basically what it does is um, there's a thing on here and I can probably show you the editor real quick. Um, let's see, that's, where is it? Um, where's the editor? Sorry for the delay here. Um, where's my C drive? I think it's got a lot of programs on here. Okay, where's I think this must be it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so if you start a new macro, uh, you have like give it a name, like temp. And you can do, I, I like the hotkeys. I use like a semicolon and then something like test. Um, so now it'll open up the editor. So here's all the things you can do. Um, now, if I look at the screenshot I took from my other computer, we can put them side by side. Uh, so what I do is, um, okay, so I simulate a keystroke with, with typing. So on the keyboard, I go text type, insert that, and then it gives me this thing. So I can type in some text like, uh, you know, hi, this is Tom, something like that. Or you can do um, combination commands like this. So um, I've set up my macro or on, on Snagit, it's looking for a hotkey. So if I have like, in this case, Alt F7, and then I think if I need to hit enter or not, I don't think so for that. I would just do that and now it's got, put this in and you can add comments to if 
you want to just remember. So this is um, uh, uh, start a Snagit capture. And then the next thing, mouse move. So this is kind of cool. So if we go to move the mouse, it's this one. Now it'll open up this little uh, I'll move it so you can see it, this mouse locator. And you can see up here the mouse positions moving around as I move the mouse. So if there's some particular spot on my keep or on my screen that I need to click on, I just move it there, look at the position up here, and then type in the numbers. So if there's, say I want to click on, um, oh, I don't know, say I want to start this VLC thing. So that's a location 2970, 983. So 2970, 983. So now I've got a mouse move and I want to put that after this. And then after you move the mouse, you want to do something. So you probably want to left click on it. And then you might need to have a delay for it to actually do something before you start doing some more things. So I'll add a delay and you can do the delay in seconds. So I could do like a one second delay or millisecond. So if I want a half a second delay, I could do 500. And then um, I can activate a window. Um, and then here I run another macro that actually moves the mouse. So I've got one macro on my other screen that just moves the, the mouse to a certain spot on the trading software, expert charts or net pips, and then gets the cursor like two bars from the, the far right. And then it moves it to my other monitor so I can move it around and not disturb the software. Um, but that's just calling another macro. Um, you can wait for different processes. So one thing I do on another one is, uh, is I monitor a process, which is uh, an active program. So let's see, terminate process. Um, let me just look at it to see what I set up. I don't that, do that one all the time. So I've got one that I call a, a restarter. Um, oh yeah, that's a logic one. So what I'm doing is I'm checking to see if a program is running or not. So I'll use um, if not program, that's the one. And okay, here it is. So then I look for all the running processes. So like um, just pick something that's working here. So if my calculator is not running, for instance, then I wanna do something. And then I have an if statement, so I need a closing if statement, and then I can put something in between. So if the calculator is not running, then I want to launch a program. And let's see, um, I can probably find an active one, calculator. There we go. So I'll launch that, oops. Um, but anyway, you can see how it works. So you just pick the event or thing that you want to do, move it over here, tweak it, and then you can test the macro, save it, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's that's what I use for um, um, for just uh, launching a screen capture, waiting, moving the mouse, and then you know, like here I wait 10 seconds because I, I move it to a 10-minute chart and just leave it there for 10 seconds so you can look at it, and then it it switches it back to a five minute chart, takes another screen capture and then moves the mouse away. So that's basically what it's doing every minute. And then th this macro just runs every minute. So that's this Macro Express. Again, it's a fantastic macro program. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many um, um, uses you have for something like that. You know, like I use one password for instance, and I have like this, this giant password I use as my master password. But I hate typing it all the time. So I set up a macro to just type in that big master password. So it's, uh, it's so much faster. But um, Yeah, I can definitely create a forum topic for automation tools. So that uh, it, it's quite helpful. So if, and again, you could even use it with your trading software like Thinkorswim or Interactive Brokers. Now I've got another macro that'll launch uh, Trader Workstation and, and put the mouse cursor where I need it. Um, so again, uh, anything that you do repetitively, a macro uh, thing like this is really, really helpful. And you know, the old programmer thing, uh, if, if you do something over and over again, try and automate it. So uh, this is a great tool for that. But yeah, I'll also set up a, um, a forum for that, Rich. 
Okay, so that's a little bit of background of uh, how I'm doing some of the stuff behind the scenes for the expert signal service. And um, yeah, I guess there's no questions for that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, all right, so let's uh, talk about some trading stuff. So Tim, uh, what are you working on these days? Uh, you, you and Wayne doing anything in particular? Oh, uh, well, slowly, you know, we we talked uh, twice, I think, in the last week uh, and had some ideas, um, but I haven't worked on it very much. Um, I haven't gone flying too much. You haven't flying too much. Yeah, I suppose. I guess you might say I'm <laughs> just not working on it as much as I should. So That's okay. Yeah, um, but we've got some, I mean, he's, he's had some great ideas if we can implement them. Um, so, I, you know, we're going to try to pursue that. Um, now I see Wayne's here. Um, now Wayne, that is that like the market sector stuff you guys are working on? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, like a uh, market sector slash stock picking, just um, something that's relatively um, a little bit more trader centric. So that's what we were looking at. Whereas, like, you know, of course, the sleep well is a little bit more for like long term investing, parking cash type of thing. So something that's a little bit more trader centric, that's just a little bit. Um, I love the filter tool that you were actually just showing. So something kind of similar to that, except um, just done with a macro lens instead of some sort of technical lens. And that way it's got some sort of fundamental backdrop, but we are going to kind of overlay both of them. So. Oh, uh, that, that, that CML biz thing, the trade machine. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's pretty intense. Um, like I said, it's been getting better over the years. They keep adding stuff. So I got in a long time ago, so I'm at a pretty low rate. I'm pretty happy about that. But, um, you know, I know they're planning on raising the price. So mm -hmm. if it's something interesting to people, I would definitely take a look at it. You know, try it out for a month. If you don't like it, you can cancel. But it's, uh, it's a pretty impressive tool. I mean, I've been doing things like that, but manually for years. So I'm like, wow, man, you know, now granted, I have my own types of technicals. So it'd be really interesting to see if we could actually somehow get those into that program. Um, but yeah, that's that's a beautiful uh, program. Like I said, it's, it's what Quanti Carlo should have been. Unfortunately, mm. they uh, they never quite got there. But, um, you know, they've been building slowly. And I'm sure if there's some technical analysis, they uh, you know, that you're interested in a request, they would take a look at it. Um, one of the things I know they do is they do tons and tons of back tests. I know Fear had a, a webinar. He was talking about one of them. I think it was by the dip, but they, they did tens of thousands of tests to test different things. So, you know, and they don't want it to work on just like one type of stock. They, they want it to work on most things. So mm -hmm. then it's a more robust system, of course. So they, they are, quite uh, diligent about doing lots of testing <laughs> that's probably a good thing i remember in my early years i uh you know i thought i was going to be a multi-millionaire i had created my first algorithm and it was like yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> and then you know three months later it all blows up in my face because the market changed a little bit just a tweak and i'm like no so it is nice to see like like i mean you can get What's nice is you can change a lot of those parameters really quick and just see if you're near a cliff of, of uh, you know, or if you're kind of in a spike of a data set where it's like, okay, yeah, if you would have gotten it just this perfect, it would have been this crazy result. But, you know, how wide is that, um, how, how wide is that parameter? You know, how tight do you have to be? Because, man, I mean, so many times I've done it to where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it looks beautiful. But then, you know, I'm back in my early days, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about, but like, you know, I'd have it tuned down to where it was like down to like 30 minute intervals, right? You know, like if I got it down to this 30 minutes over the last, you know, 10 years, look how perfect this was. And of course, you know, it changes a little bit. So it goes from 30 minutes to maybe like an hour and a half, right? And then all of a sudden it just blows up in your face. <laughs> so, right. yeah, algorithms don't necessarily always continue to work in the markets. So that's what's kind of funny about them. So. Oh, and I do see a question from Rich. Does it have an OCR engine to capture data? I know uh, Snagit does. That's one thing. You can take an image with Snagit and, and um, extract the text out of it, which is pretty awesome. I've used that before. Um, I haven't used it extensively, but there, there is an OCR engine built into Snagit. So sorry for that little detour there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think uh, 
um, as far as a trade machine pro, I think they would be open to suggestions. Um, like one yeah, thing I would like to see is uh, um, something with the percent contango between the first and second month futures for VIX. Mm, yeah. That would be really interesting to have as a back testing, um, a technical analysis tool. Do you use that a lot in your trading? Well, uh, John uh, John Bailey suggested this a long time ago, and his threshold is if the contango gets below three percent, then start looking for uh, you know to reduce your long exposure or even get short a little bit. And um, I've I've always kind of used that as a threshold in my mind too that. You know, once that contango gets you know below three percent, then um, things are kind of getting a little frothy. Mm -hmm. So it'd be it would be interesting if you could add a tool like that to the CML Viz, the trade machine, and see okay, is three percent a good number or two percent, or if it goes negative, or you know, at what point, um, how do you use that in your technical analysis and uh, back testing? Yeah, something with the contango would be really nice. I remember I did one sort of test that was. Uh... At a certain amount of backwardation go long, which is a little bit opposite of what you were talking about. But um, well, not really. I mean, you don't get backwardation until the the that uh, the difference is negative. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, the crazies are are coming out at that moment. So um, that's also like uh, when when VIX is probably at the level that you were talking about. That's probably a good time that you could actually start shorting some things if you're a, if you're a short seller. Yeah, like like one issue. Um, okay, so they have VIX in their technical analysis, and you can say, okay, if VIX is above or below, or crosses above or crosses below. But if the VIX has changed over the last uh, year or so, maybe two years, where it used to be like you know maybe like a ten to twelve up to maybe eighteen was kind of high, but now it's like twenty is kind of normal, twenty twenty five. <laughs> So you can't really use the same numbers that you did, um, you know, say five years ago. It just, it's not the same. Yeah. Everyone would talk about mean reversion and VIX for so long. And, you know, I mean, there's times in history where it, uh, it stays elevated for quite a while. So it, you know, um, I remember I was working with a, uh, well, back when I did mentoring, I was working with a student and, uh, and the student was using an absolute VIX number and, I was like, hey, man, you know, that's working right now, but it's that's not going to work at some point in time um, because, you know, we're going to get into like another situation where just there's just elevated volatility for a while. And, um, you know, it's it's amazing how that happens. And it is it's been pretty crazy. I mean, I'm sure low VIX will come back. Um, you know, it'll be eventual, but regular cycles in the market. Oh, that was like, uh, did you ever study any of like the 90s uh, VIX eras? Like if you like, if you, if you, I know the VIX doesn't go back that far, but if you uh, synthetically calculate it. Um, I haven't done a lot with that. Um, yeah. No. My guess is it sounds like you have. Oh, uh, yeah. At one point I did. I mean, I couldn't just rattle something off the top of my head or anything like that. But I remember it was like extremely elevated for quite a while. It, we were in the 20s and 22s for um, years, actually. So, um, you know, uh, I know Dave's been doing some other stuff with uh, his little bit closer time frames and stuff like that. So that's been pretty exciting. And then um, Tim, uh, Tim, you started reducing some of your exposure, right? Yeah, I've, I've, I've cut things down a bit um, in terms of size of the trades, you know. Uh, even boxcar, uh, I was doing, trying to get up to two odd and more, and then I, I've cut back down to one lot again for a little while. We're, we're just going to be a little smaller. Is that just because of the volatility in the market? Yeah. You know, VIX is 21, which you might say isn't that high, and uh, but uh, and maybe it isn't that high, but we still get 90 point days on the Russell or 110 point days on the SPX. I'd say that's consistent with higher VIX, you know? Right. right Tim, uh, are you seeing that the options are reflecting that level of point moves? I would say no, because um, the premiums that I'm seeing on on Russell and the SPX uh, just don't seem to be high as they should be. And I looked up uh, one day, same day Iron Condor this morning, you know, and um, 
I, I don't feel like the premiums as high as they should be. And then on all my covered calls, um, you know, if I'm selling like a call on Johnson & Johnson, that's um, three points out of the money for a one week expiration, right? Uh, last time I got uh, something like 35 or 40 cents for that. And today I only got like 25 cents or something. I should look it up. Um, 28 cents today. And last time I got um, 33 cents. And it doesn't sound like much, but you have to remember that was March 8th when I got 33 cents and Johnson & Johnson was at 158.41. Okay, today, Johnson & Johnson was at 158.84, which is 40 cents higher, yet the five-day call premium was 28 cents instead of 33. So to answer your question, I would say no, I don't, I don't think we're seeing it in the option pricing. Yeah, so Vic says, I agree with the premium not reflecting the volatility. Uh, would this be a good time to buy premium? That would be depending on where you're buying the premium. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it depends yeah. on where and how. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, and on on which stocks and things like that. Um, I would have to look at my measurement. I haven't looked at it in in a couple of days, but um, I was actually showing an elevated premium just below the market, but then uh, further out. Um, it was not so much, so then it would be a, a good time to buy a premium. So how far back are you looking at those uh, puts? Oh, this, oh, go ahead. This is a VIX chart with a monthly. It goes back to like 90 something. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, the 97s. Yeah, where it just stayed elevated for a long time going into the 2000s. It's kind of up was, where it is now. <laughs> Yeah, and well, and that's the what was um, that's what was really similar to like the current period, right? Is late '90s the stock market was hitting new highs, yeah. right? I mean, déjà vu, so, right? Right, exactly. So it's very, very eerily similar, right? And you can see that it came off of like really low VIX. I'm actually really glad that someone got this data back then. I, I last time I looked at this, of course, it was years ago. Um, it didn't have it back into the early eight, uh, '90s, so that's really nice. Looks like it starts on January 1st, 90. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you're hitting new highs, you're hitting new VIX highs, and then you're getting like this base level of VIX staying elevated, which is very similar to what we've had over the last few years, and we're still getting hitting new highs. Um, so it's one of those things that like a time period where you can have multiple years and, you know, I'm not saying there's, you know, a bear market crash coming or anything like that, but there's a lot of things, you know, sitting on the sidelines that you can really start showing up over the next few years. And just about now, people are starting to lay off of the break, you know, behaviorally and investing and starting to put the gas back on and investing again. Um, so, and there's still a lot of economic problems sitting behind us, but we do have a massively printing fed, so uh, it's not a problem. Um, there's a lot of windfalls in the short term, but yeah, really interesting. Right. But yeah, I was asking Tim, um, that put that you were talking about, um, do you know how many standard deviations out where you were buying it? Call. Um, oh, call, yeah, sorry. No, but I can tell you what it is today. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, let's see. Um, so I don't have something set right. Let's see. All right. Uh, thank you, March. Today I sold the 162.50 call on Jan J. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> oh, that's funny, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> You know, but, it's amazing how long the market can stay in that range, though. I mean, like, there was so many people. I remember, um, so one of my friends is a financial advisor, and he's been around for quite a while. And he um, he was dealing with clients going into the 90s. And um, pretty much just what we were talking about, where the VIX started to create new high levels, the amount of people, you know, uh, cashing out of their accounts and 
not being invested in the market, what he said was just rampant. I mean, he talked to probably, you know, just four or five clients a day that just wanted to pull everything out of the markets. And, um, and he remembers, you know, uh, just for years after those conversations, the stock market just kept hitting new highs, new highs, new highs, new highs. And it was just doing it in a really, really violent way, but it was doing it. Um, and then finally, you know, I think he had said, I think it was like four years after he had a lot of those, those crazy conversations that he was having, it finally started to roll over. And that's when the, the dot-com bubble burst. And then those so, people like, see, I told you. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's like, well, yeah, but you missed out on four years of like amazing gains. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, just because it's volatile doesn't mean that it can't go up. But, you know, and, and something that I've looked at for a long time was um, uh, VIX to SPX correlation. And um, I remember looking at those late 90s and uh, 2000s that um, that starts to break down when you start to make new highs and VIX starts to create new general highs. So yeah, it's, it was a really interesting study, actually. Maybe I'll dig it up and post it. So um, the call that I sold on Johnson Johnson this morning was, um, it's just about one standard deviation above the market. Um, Thinkorswim's uh, market make and move thing says three points in uh, four days, which would be uh, which means that my 16250 would be just over a market maker move out of money. And the graph shows uh, about the same thing. So it's it's probably 1.1 1 .1 standard deviations or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, just really, really heavy skew. It, it, yeah. Uh, there's a uh, man, someone on the forums had posted this. And uh, let me see here. I'm going to pull it up because. Uh, um, it was Scott Mixon's uh, paper on skew. And oh my gosh, was it just a, it was just a brilliant paper. I mean, if anyone wants to dig into skew, um, I think, you know, definitely go check it out. Um, uh, you're all actually. While well, you're waiting, I might also add, <clears throat> if you take my 28 cent premium divided out, <clears throat> I get about a 15.7 percent annualized return if it expires and if you take that 33 cent one that i only did just a week ago same number of days to expiration and everything same number of points out of the money actually a little bit further out of the money mm. and it comes out to 18.5 percent so last week it was three percent more annualized return than this week you know so yeah all that supports yeah i don't think the premiums are there right now right yeah and and you know here uh Hey, Tom, can you enable screen sharing? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Go go for it. Let's see. I just wanted to um, share this. This is the paper that I was talking about. Um, like I said, Scott Mixon. Um, he, it's, this is a very, very, very in-depth guide to skew. And um, anyways, so uh, this is like in its crazy skewness, right? And and this is kind of what you're talking about, Tim, where there's just not a lot of premium um, beyond or right right beyond a standard deviation to the upside because it just drops off like a brick so hard, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and and what's always ironic about this is that um, when skew does do this, the premiums are actually crushed up here. So that's exactly, it's exactly what you're talking about, Tim, where there's just not a lot of premium up here. And that's just because that skew is so pushed up. Now, yep. granted, theoretically, that means that we should have good ATM volatility premium. Um, but what we've noticed over the last few years is that this edge that's normally right here because of this depressed uh, skew, um, if anyone remembers like the, the, the butterfly eras of 2015 and stuff like that, that was this mathematical edge right here was this depressed skew ATM. Um, anyways, that's, act that's actually been uh, lifted up quite a bit. So we're kind of getting a blend of this really, really ridiculous skew. And then we're also getting um, kind of like a medium skew where like these options are just relatively um, undervalued still, or at least very, very fair valued so that that edge really isn't there anymore. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what you're saying, right, right, Tim, where it's just, 
you're probably right there uh, somewhere in this area where there's just so much probability uh, that it's just really kind of hurting the premiums. Right. And I don't want to sell an ATM call here, you know, <laughs> well, there's, there's not a lot I can do, you know. I mean, on a positive note, and this is exactly what we've seen with, you know, almost all these strategy, all the premium selling strategies, they used to be in this area, right? Um, just behind the market, we used to be able to be like a butterfly right here. Um, and then um, now everything's getting pushed back. And that's because, you know, the edge is, uh, is just a little bit higher back here, right? And so they're trying to just, everything's trying to just push back to try to get more uh, edge. So you can think about this, the more elevated this line is over a standard deviation, which is this blue one back here, right? The more premium that's there, that statistically isn't going to get hit as long as you've got good risk uh, management, because eventually it will get hit. That's why it's there, but it's a, uh, it's skewed. Let's see. So anyways, uh, if, if you've got the time to read this paper and you kind of want to dig into all this, uh, it's really beautiful. Um, honestly, this guy uh, goes really hardcore in depth and, and a lot of this stuff even goes over my head. So I know a lot of the conceptuals and, um, how it works in the markets and stuff like that. But as far as, the, you know, some of his, um, some of his, his analysis, it, it gets pretty heavy. So I would point out, um, like I said, Scott Mixon's uh, paper, it's in the, uh, it's, it's in the form of how skew shape affects volatility. Or hey, Tim, uh -huh. I had a, I had a question for you on the parking trade. What deltas do you think you, you're you're using? I know you go for like a dollar premium, but um, roughly, what would you say it is? Like ten and eight, or it's somewhere around there, eight to ten. I, I think that's a really good guess. Um, I can look if you know today's not a great day to start when we're going we're going down a little bit, but um, look and see what it would be if I did it right now. That would be. 30 days. I just plugged that into trade machine just for grins. I did a 10 and a seven, I think. Okay. And then I used 80% um, profit for your, and once you're at 80%, just close it. Yeah. And if you have a 50% loss and close it. And over the last two years, it had uh, 153 trades and made a 135% return. Yeah. And there's your win rate, 78%. Yeah. I mean, that's, that seems about right. That seems about right. Um, let's see, why am I having trouble working this up? Oh, because I'm doing it backwards. Don't do it backwards, do it forward, okay. Okay, so 3530. Is a nine delta, and that's still a little bit too high right now. So if I went down to 3510, uh, it's still too high. Okay. How about 3490? is exactly a dollar. So 3490 is an eight delta. So yeah, I, I think you're right. That's what it usually turned out to be. So is this pretty close? 10 and seven? Yeah, that's pretty close. Okay. So there's your parking trade. So here you could play around with, you know, if you don't take a profit and you don't cut a loss, what happens? Then you're at a 92% win with a 47% return. Um, but if you cut your loss, let's say, I don't know, say 60%, what does that do? Okay, your win rate went down a little bit. Your returns went down a little bit. Um, let's see, max loss was, how does it have a max loss? This average loss. How many contracts is that? 10, that's a 10 lot. Um, but it's kind of fun. You can play around with this stuff to see, uh, you know, how much risk tolerance do you have? That's so kind of cool. If you do like an 80% loss rate, what does that do? Of course, this is, um, just putting them on uh, in all the time, right? Yeah, all the time. So there's no no technical analysis that you're using with this. So no as soon as one's on over, you put the next one on. Yeah, the odds would greatly improve if you put them on only when there was a, a 
one percent or greater decline in the SPX that day. I'll see if we can do that stock move today or yesterday. Probably today, today right? Today, yeah, today, right? Then we'll go down one percent or more. Try that, yeah. Oh, that actually lost money. There were a lot less trades. Um, let me reset this to 50 and like 80. See what that does. Well, that made a little bit. Uh, I should have should have made a big difference. So something isn't quite right here, but that's the idea. You know, you can't get a 1% or more down day. Um, Volatility's up, premiums are up, you know, you get put out of money, all that good stuff, and it, it improves the trade. I wonder if you do it from yesterday's move, if that makes a difference. Oh, you had up. Sorry, Tom, you had up. Oh, I had up. Oh, yeah. no wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would that would kind of affect it, wouldn't it? That would affect uh, it, I think, yeah. All right, let's try down. I love how fast this is. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, it'd it's be like, nice if we could do a percentage of volatility or um, like a percentage of ATR or something like that. Can it do that? Because yeah. a lot of what's happening here is we're getting a down day that's a pretty sizable down day for the volatility environment we're in, right? Um, but, you know, waiting for 1%, there's a lot of entries that aren't coming in, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, we could do like a Bollinger Band breakout or um, I don't know what does it say for the stock price. Oh, above or below or passing up or passing down through a moving average. That's another one you can use. And the VIX level is just um, these choices. So it's it's kind of hard. I mean, what do you use with the VIX up in the 20s now? 18 wouldn't make any sense right now. No, that's an absolute number. I mean, I'd I'd hate to do something like that. It would, it would. You'd have to just um, test it for like the last year. Yeah, you kind of want a VIX breakout or like, can you do a ball in, Can you do a Ballinger band on the VIX? That would be nice, huh? Uh, I don't think so. Let's see. Yeah, it's talking about the stock price. Dang. Um, I'll make a suggestion to him though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just we're playing around with things. Yeah, I mean, just everything that I've ever done, um, you know, that that I've noticed in programming algorithms and things like that is, you know, just when you start using absolute numbers or things that can change, or you know, just because the environment's been this way for so long, I mean, eventually they break down, and that's kind of what you're running into with using a fixed absolute number right there. Right. Yeah, so and so curious how it would do in like the. 2007 to 2009 time period right and i mean you know if we push it to an extreme it kind of makes sense too so like your parking trade tim like if we were to go hey we're going to enter every time we have a one percent down move well in 2008 we do that like what every day almost right you yeah. know um because yeah. we just get a one i mean just a normal move just i mean you breathe to the market and it goes down one percent so yeah. um and in the 90s it was that way too right i mean we were having Two to three percent up days and three percent down days. So, um, doing something that's actually a derivative of volatility or like ATR or something like that, you know, as an ATR as a percentage of the index or of, of the stock price, that would be a decent entry type of thing. Yeah. Now, are you using thirty-day options, Tim, on the parking trade? Yeah. Okay, so I got that right. You've got it pretty close. I didn't pick the shorts by Delta, the longs by Delta, but it's pretty close. So, uh, let's see. Um, and this is. Uh, oh yeah, the problem with the CML is when the program enters a trade. If it's a down today, I think the program enters a trade at the open of the next day. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'll have to ask them. I get some clarification on that. Yeah. Anyway, it's fun to kind of play around with it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like we're out of time. So uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Really enjoyed it. And um, I see it's already in the 40s today. So the snow's melting. So my eight inches of snow is starting to go down. So 
Um, it looks like there was one more message. Um, oh, thanks. Okay. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And um, yeah, I guess we'll, uh, we'll see you all next week. Have a good week trading and um, yeah, we'll see you next time and uh, have fun flying, Tim. Stay safe. Okay. All right. We'll see you, everyone.